on the screen. Okay, great. Greetings, everybody. Welcome to Journey to the Bible. All right, there's nobody else around, so I'm taking off my mask. Greetings. Welcome to Journey to the Bible. This is Father Paul Joseph at St. Margaret Mary Church in Lomita, and we are continuing our journey through St. Paul's letter to the Romans. Actually, we're going to be con we're concluding St. Paul's letter to the Romans today. It is the longest of St. Paul's letters. It is 16 chapters. We've been doing four chapters each week, and amazingly how four divides into 16 to get four. So we're on our fourth week, session number four of St. Paul's letter to the Romans. Let's take a moment and bow our heads in prayer. In the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Good and gracious God, we come before you as your children, recognizing the inspiration of the sacred scriptures that guide us in our journey of faith. We recognize the writings of St. Paul are often difficult to read. Once again, it's a confusing situation when we look at the issues he's dealing with because we don't always know what they are. But we do know that he was writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And while it may take a little time to wade through some of these readings, we do know that they're an inspired word of God that guides us in our journey of faith. And during this hour, help us to continue to recognize the inspiration of the Holy Spirit that guides us in our lives as well. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I'm going to reach over here and grab my cup of water. I just finished a one-hour presentation for new pastors on parish finances. See, I have my outline here. Financial information for new pastors. I was a CPA for 18 years and a pastor for 14 years. And I figured, well, if you have a little information you may want to share with others, why not? And then tomorrow, for, uh, today is Thursday, and tomorrow, Friday, I will be doing a, uh, no, today's Wednesday. I'm sorry, today's Wednesday. I'm all over the place here. Today is Wednesday. And on Friday, I'm doing a presentation for our young adult ministry on the history of the church. And they've asked me to do that in a one-hour session. So if anybody knows how I can do a one-hour summary of the last 2,020 years of the church, please let me know. I'm open to ideas. All right. But for now, we go into St. Paul's letter to the Romans. And this is chapter 13. Now, one of the things before we begin chapter 13 is to remember St. Paul lived in a time period very different than what we're living in now. They did not have elected officials. What they had, they had people who were either kings or queens or emperors or princes or princesses, and they had all these people who were appointed by their buddies or married into the royalty or born into it. And so it was a very different world then. And St. Paul and the rest of the Christians were going through struggles with the Roman authorities. So St. Paul comes up with an idea, and this is how he begins the letter to the Romans, chapter 13, verse 1. Check the time. Let every person be subordinate to the higher authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been established by God. Therefore, Whoever resists authority opposes what God has appointed, and those who oppose it will bring judgment upon themselves. For rulers are not a cause of fear to good conduct, but to evil. Do you wish to have no fear of authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive approval from it, for it is a servant of God for your good. But if you do evil, be afraid, for it does not bear the sword without purpose. It is a servant of God to inflict wrath on the evildoer. Therefore, it is necessary to be subject not only because of the wrath, but because also of the conscience. That is why you also pay taxes for the authorities or ministers of God devoting themselves to this very thing. Pay to all their dues, taxes to whom taxes are due, toll to whom toll is due, respect to whom respect is due, honor to whom honor is due. This is a very difficult thing for the time of St. Paul, and it's also difficult now. Are we really comfortable paying taxes for so many things that bother us about our government and our country? But do we also recognize the necessity of paying taxes for our, those who are involved in our uh, military service who protect our freedoms and the freedoms of others throughout the world? We recognize the need to pay taxes for our police department, fire department, paramedics, all those who serve us. We look at the idea of our public schools, particularly our public colleges and universities, 
we look at how the large percentage of their tuition is subsidized by the taxpayer because we want to have educated young people. But then at the same time, we look at the money that is spent for abortion, for death penalty, assisted suicide, all the things that violate the culture of life, things that go against our church teaching. Well, if we recall in the Gospels, somebody asked Jesus, should you pay the temple tax or not? Should you pay taxes? And he said, render to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and render to God what becomes, belongs to God. Now, as I've mentioned each week, one of the sources that I'm using is Father Dan Harrington's book, Romans, The Good News According to Paul. It's an excellent book. I wish he had written one of these on every book in the Bible. Unfortunately, he didn't, but I'm taking advantage of it now. But he talks about the idea of what's happening with the people of Rome and what St. Paul is doing here. And he says, for a very different view of the Roman Empire, see the book of Revelation. In the book of Revelation, St. John, inspired by the Holy Spirit, is challenging what is be the authorities and the leaders in the Roman Empire. The good news is that Father Har Dan Harrington did write a book just like this on Revelation. And when we get to the book of Revelation, we'll go through that in more detail. Father Harrington says the spreading of the gospel throughout the Mediterranean world in the first century was facilitated to a large extent by the Roman Empire, especially by the relative peacefulness that it imposed and by the opportunities for travel by land and sea that it provided. Rome was the capital of the empire and the Christians at Rome were probably under some official scrutiny. So this is probably why St. Paul wrote what he did. We look at the idea of being subordinate to higher authorities when they're doing what is right. When they're doing what is wrong, which is against the will of God, then we take a look at how we are called to respond, how we are called to have our voices heard. Still in chapter 13, verse eight, owe nothing to anyone except to love one another. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. I've said this before, and I say this at every wedding, the emphasis of the Bible, if you were going to take the Bible and summarize it in one word, it would be love. God's love for us and our call to love God and love one another. And then I turned to the couple and I said, nowhere is that love more profound than in two people coming together as husband and wife, as long as they both shall live. Sickness or in health, richer for poorer, better or for worse, they are joined together. So I'm going to repeat verse eight again. Owe nothing to anyone except to love one another, for the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not kill, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. And whatever other commandments there may be are summed up in this saying, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does, does no evil to the neighbor, hence love is the fulfillment of the law. St. Paul is telling us the same thing that Jesus told us in each one of the four Gospels, the message of love, love of neighbor and love of God. In verse 11, and do this because you know the time. It is the hour now for you to awake from sleep, for our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is advanced. The day is at hand. Let us throw off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. As we've said before, St. Paul and many of the other apostles believed that the second coming of Jesus was going to happen very soon in their lifetime. Later on, St. Paul will say, if you're married, stay married. If you're single, stay single. If you're a slave, stay a slave. If you're free, stay free. Don't worry about all this. It's all gonna be over soon. Jesus will be back. As I've said many times before, his message is correct. His timing, not so much. So looking again at verse 11, and do this because you know the time. It is the hour now for you to wake from sleep, for our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is advanced. The day is at hand. Let us throw off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us conduct ourselves properly as in the day, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in promiscuity and licentiousness, not in rivalry and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make, make no provision for the desires of the flesh. 
The desires of the flesh are just part of our human nature. Everybody is selfish in some ways. Somebody is only always looking out for themselves. But what St. Paul is talking about here is when we put the desires of the flesh before our spiritual desires, that's when we get into the trouble. And that's why he actually mentions examples. We know what was going on with Rome. There were the orgies. There were the prostitutes. They even had temple prostitutes. They had boy prostitutes for men who had gotten tired of having sex with other men. So let's try the teenage boys. Let's see how that is. It was a very difficult time. Rome was the capital of the Roman Empire, and a lot was going on that St. Paul clearly says is not the will of God. So in verse 14, he says, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make, make no provision for the desires of the flesh. Now, in chapter 14, bear with me just a second here. Chapter 14, he's going to talk about those who are weak in faith. And he's not putting them down, but it's the idea of recognizing how we can share the good news of the gospel with others, grow our own faith, and grow the faith of others. Chapter 14, verse 1. Welcome anyone who is weak in faith, but not for disputes over opinions. One person believes that one may eat anything, while the weak person eats only vegetables. The one who eats must not despise the one who abstains, and the one who abstains must not pass judgment on the one who eats, for God has welcomed him. This was a question that was going on where Jesus rendered all foods to be clean, but there were still some people who had trouble with eating pork or eating shellfish or mixing meat and dairy products. So he's saying, don't get into disputes over opinions. Jesus has already settled this. Even in today, there's some people who argue about certain things. I'm gonna be a vegetarian. I'm gonna be a vegan. I'm gonna be all these other sorts of things. And it's fine, let everybody make their decisions. But as he says in verse four, who are you to pass judgment on someone else's servant? Before his own master stands or falls and he will be upheld for the Lord is able to make him stand. Once again, judge not lest you be judged. In verse five, for one person considers one day more important than another, while another person considers all alike. Let everyone be fully persuaded in his own mind. Some people come to mass on Saturday evening. I know growing up, we never had a Saturday evening mass. We only had Sunday morning masses and the last one was the 12 o'clock noon mass. We didn't have an evening mass on Saturday or on Sunday. So things have changed. But as St. Paul says, let everyone be fully persuaded in his own mind. And verse six, Whoever observes the day, observes it for the Lord. And whoever eats, eats for the Lord, since he gives thanks to the Lord, while whoever abstains, abstains for the Lord and gives thanks to God. So again, we look at the food that is necessary for our bodily nourishment, but also recognize that we are called to give thanks to God. Beginning in verse seven is a famous passage that I think really rings true for anyone who reads the sacred scriptures. And this is still chapter 14, verse 7. None of us lives for oneself, and no one dies for oneself. For if we live, we live for the Lord. And if we die, we die for the Lord. So that then, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. For this is why Christ died and came to life, that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. We hear this at funerals quite often. This is why Christ died and came to life, that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. He is the Lord for everyone. In verse 10, why then do you judge your brother? Or you, why do you look down on your brother? We shall all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bend before me and every tongue shall give praise to God. So then each of us shall give an account of himself to God. It's that message, praising God, worshiping God, bowing down to God. And then we will be forced to give an account of ourselves to God. No one is perfect. We all have faults and failings, but we are all forgiven. That's why we have the sacrament of reconciliation. That's why we have the sacrament of the anointing of the sick. We are forgiven by our Lord and Savior. We are forgiven by our loving God.
In verse 13, then let us no longer judge one another, but rather resolve never to put a stumbling block or hindrance in the way of a brother. I know and I am convinced in the Lord that nothing is unclean in itself. Still, it is unclean for someone who thinks it's unclean. The person who's still refusing to eat pork or dairy product, mixing dairy products with meat or shellfish, that's fine. It is unclean for them. Let them have that and respect them. If your brother is being hurt by what you eat, your conduct is no longer in accord with love. Do not, because of your food, destroy him for whom Christ died. Don't get into all the details. Don't get into the minutia. Recognize the spirit of the law as the message of love. And verse 16, so do not let your good be reviled. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of food and drink, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Whoever serves Christ in this way is pleasing to God and approved by others. I look at that idea where he says it's a matter of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. There was a book that we had in the seminary, and I can't remember who wrote it. It was a great book, but he says, does your faith bring you joy? Your faith should bring you joy. And you look at the idea of the difference between happiness. We look at happiness overall. We have joy and pleasure. Pleasure is when you buy that new car. Pleasure is buy when you buy those new clothes. Pleasure is when you have things that are material items. Joy is when we have fulfillment in the Lord. Somebody asked me once, do you find it a pleasure to go and visit sick people in the hospital, those who are dying? No, it is not a pleasure. Does it bring me joy? Absolutely. Joy being able to pray with the sick person, pray with their family and their friends, bring them comfort, bring them that message of salvation. So Jesus has called us to this, and St. Paul is reminding us, verse 22 well, excuse me, verse nine, let me go back to verse 19. I got off on a sidetrack there. Verse 19. Let us then pursue what leads to peace and to building up one another. The idea of don't tear other people down. Some people think that they can be superior over others by pushing them down. Shouldn't we raise each other up? So in verse 19, let us then pursue what leads to peace and to building up one another. For the sake of food, do not destroy the work of God. Everything is indeed clean, but it is wrong for anyone to become a stumbling block by eating. It is good not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything that causes your brother to stumble. Keep the faith you have to yourself and the presence of God. That whole message, keep the faith you have to yourself and the presence of God. Blessed is the one who does not condemn himself for what he approves, Whatever has doubts is condemned if he eats, because this is not from faith. For whatever is not from faith is sin. St. Paul is drawing a real dividing line here. It's from faith or it's from sin. How do we know? Just like the idea of how do we know the quality of a tree? We know by the fruit that it produces. If the tree produces good fruit, it is a good tree. If it produces bad fruit, it is a bad tree. Chapter 15, we who are strong ought to put up with the failing of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let each of us please our neighbor for the good, for the building up. For Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the insults of those who insult you fall upon me. It's the idea of knowing that Jesus feels our pain. Jesus did not come here to please himself. He did not come for earthly pleasures. Was it pleasing to him when he was interrupted by a blind person or a deaf person or a crippled person? Obviously, that was not pleasure. Did it bring him joy? Absolutely. In verse 3, for Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the insults of those who insult you fall upon me. Whatever was written previously was written for our instruction, that by endurance and by the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope, faith, hope, and love. In verse 5, may the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to think in harmony with one another and keeping with Christ Jesus. 
that with one accord, you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ with one accord and with one voice. He is calling us not to division, but to draw those circles of inclusion. And we are called to glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, for he is our creator. He is the one who made each one of us in his image and likeness. In verse 7, welcome one another then as Christ welcomed you for the glory of God. That's one of the things that we all concentrate as priests and lay ministers and people involved in our liturgies. How do we welcome people into our church community? Even now we're on the patio. We have to move the seats. They have to be six feet apart. We have to have social distancing. We have to have families sitting together, but separate from other families. And a lot of people are struggling with that. He said, these people live down the street from me. Why can't I sit next to them at mass? Well, it's obviously because of the pandemic. Our goal is to make everyone feel welcome regardless of the circumstances. So Jesus says in verse seven, welcome one another then as Christ welcomed you for the glory of God. For I say that Christ became a minister of the circumcised to show God's truthfulness, to confirm the promises to the patriarchs so that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. Remember, St. Paul was the apostle to the Gentiles. The Gentiles were the non-Jews primarily Romans, Greeks, people from Turkey and those areas. They were the Gentiles, and St. Paul is the apostle to the Gentiles. And verse 9, but so that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. And it is the mercy and compassion of our Lord Jesus Christ that we put our faith and hope in. As it is written, therefore I will praise your name among the Gentiles and sing praise to your name. And again, it says, rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and let all the peoples praise you. And again, Isaiah says, the root of Jesse shall come, raised up to rule the Gentiles, and him shall the Gentiles hope. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, remember, Jesse, Jesse was the father of King David. The Jewish people had Saul, not St. Paul that we're reading about today, but Saul, who was the first king of the Jewish people. But as we know, it didn't work out well because he didn't follow God's plan. So then Samuel called Jesse and said, Jesse, one of your sons is going to become the new king. Bring them here to me. So Jesse brings all of his sons and and Samuel looks at each one of them and says, no, 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 it's, oh gosh, this isn't working out. What's going on here? Don't you have any others? Oh, yes, I got this one. His name's David. He's the youngest. He's out there tending the sheep. Um, you know, I figured it's not worth bringing him in here. And Samuel said, bring him in. And as soon as he saw him, he knew that was the one. So that's what we took at the idea of the root of Jesse. That is the son of Jesse who became King David. In verse 14, I myself am convinced about you, my brothers, that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, and able to admonish one another. This is a profound statement here. Full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, and able to admonish one another. But I have written to remind you, because of the grace given me by God, to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles, and performing the priestly service of the gospel of God, so that the offering up of the Gentiles may be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Paul is pointing this out because there were many Hebrew Jewish people who believed that because of their the house of Israel, that the message of salvation was over for, only for them. But St. Paul says something different, that the message will be for the Gentiles may be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In verse 17, in Christ Jesus, then, I have reason to boast in what pertains to God, for I will not dare to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me to lead the Gentiles to obedience by word and deed. The idea of leading the Gentiles, they had no concept of the Hebrew scriptures, what we call the Old Testament. They need to be led. They need to be led by word and deed, by the powers of signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God, 
So from Jerusalem all the way to Illyricum, I have finished preaching the gospel of Christ. Once again, St. Paul is setting his goal to proclaim the gospel message throughout the entire Roman Empire. Now remember, when this was written, he had not yet even been to Rome. He was planning to go back to Jerusalem, and then he was going to go to Rome on his way to Spain. Again, we don't know if he ever made it to Spain, but his goal was to proclaim the message, the gospel message of Christ throughout the known world, which was the Roman Empire. And verse 20, thus I aspire to proclaim the gospel, not where Christ has already been named, so that I do not build on another's foundation. But as it is written, those who have never been told of him shall see, and those who have never heard of him shall understand. We look at this idea, those who have never been told of him. What about the children of today who are learning nothing about our faith, nothing about the mass, the sacraments, the sacred scriptures? Those who have never been told of him shall see, and those who have never heard of him shall understand. That is our prayer for our world today. Now, in verse 22, St. Paul is starting to document his uh, plans, his travel plans. He's coming to the end of this letter. So in chapter 15, verse 22, that is why I've so often been prevented from coming to you. But now, since I no longer have any opportunity in these regions, and since I have desired to come to you for many years, I hope to see you in passing as I go to Spain and to be sent on my way there by you after I've enjoyed being with you for a time. This is exactly what he's saying. Roman church has been established. I don't not need to build on what someone else has done, but I do want to meet you. I want to spend time with you. And after I've enjoyed being with you, I will continue on to Spain. In verse 25, now, however, I'm going to Jerusalem to minister to the holy ones. For Macedonia and Achaia have decided to make some contribution for the poor among the holy ones in Jerusalem. They decided to do it, and in fact, they are indebted to them. For the Gentiles have come to share in their spiritual blessings, they ought also to serve them in material blessings. His point is the Gentiles have received the good news of the gospel. They've received the benefits. Are they ready to share their material blessings? In verse 28, so when I have completed this and safely handed over this contribution to them, I shall set out by way of you to Spain. And I know that in coming to you, I shall come in the fullness of Christ's blessing. So once again, did St. Paul ever make it to Spain? When we get to heaven, we'll have to ask him because there's no indication in the scriptures that he ever actually made it. In verse 30, I urge you brothers, by our Lord Jesus Christ, and by the love of the Spirit, to join me in the struggle by your prayers to God on my behalf, that I may be delivered from the disobedient in Judea, and that my ministry may be acceptable to the holy ones, so that I may come to you with joy by the will of God, and be refreshed together with you. The God of peace be with you all. Amen. Now, he's going back to Judea, but he's obviously going through some struggles. Remember, Judea is the area of Jerusalem in the south. Uh, excuse me, the area of Israel in the south. Near Jerusalem, near Bethlehem, near Bethany, not far from the Dead Sea, not far from Jericho. This is the area that he's going back to, Judea. The northern part was the area of Galilee, the Sea of Galilee, Nazareth, and Capernaum. As we know, they are connected by the Jordan River that flows south from the Sea of Galilee, all the way down to the Dead Sea. So St. Paul concludes this chapter by saying, the God of peace be with all of you, amen. It's a wonderful blessing and it's a wonderful thought that he has there. All right, we are now coming to the last chapter of St. Paul's letter to the Romans. This is chapter 16. I commend to you Phoebe, our sister, who is also a minister of the church, a sanctuary, that you may receive her in the Lord as a manner worthy of the holy ones and help her in whatever she may need from you, for she has been a benefactor to many and to me as well. Some of the translations say that Phoebe is a minister of the church 
and also some refer to her as a deaconess. We do not have women deacons in the church. Pope Francis and the Magisterium is studying that concept right now about the idea of having women deacons. And the first thing that they will look at is what has happened in the history of the church. Is there a precedent that's already been set? Well, a lot of people point out Phoebe who is a minister of the church that she is probably a deaconess. Well, this is a question that's being raised right now. And as you know, it's not gonna be resolved today or tomorrow. They told us in the seminary, the wheels of the church grind exceedingly finely and exceedingly slowly. So things do not happen overnight in the church, which is actually a very good thing because so often people have had a knee jerk reaction of how to do something. Oh yes, great, that's a good idea. And then after further thought, they realize that that is not exactly what we're called to. In verse three, St. Paul instructs them, greet Prissa and Aquila, my co-workers in Christ Jesus, who risked their necks for my life, to whom not only am I grateful, but all of the church of the Gentiles. Greet also the church at their house. Greet my beloved Eponidas, who was the first fruits in Asia for Christ. Greet Mary, who has worked hard for you. Greet Andronicus and Junia, my relatives and my fellow prisoners. They are prominent among the apostles and they were in Christ before me. Remember, St. Paul was not a follower of Jesus while Jesus was here on earth. It wasn't until after Jesus ascended into heaven that he had his conversion. Verse eight, greet Ampliatus, my beloved in the Lord. Greet Urbanus, our coworker in Christ and my beloved Stachys. Greet Apelles, who is approved in Christ. Greet those who belong to the family of Aristobulus. Greet my relative Herodian. Greet those in the Lord who belong to the family of Narcissus. Greet those workers in the Lord. Tryphania and Tryphosa. Greet the beloved Persis who has worked hard in the Lord. Greet Rufus, chosen in the Lord, and his mother and mine. Greet Asyncreus, Phlegion, Hermas, Petrobus, Hermas, and the brothers who are with them. Greet Philogius, Julia, Nerus, and his sister, and Olympus, and all the holy ones who are here with them. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the churches of Christ greet you. The idea of greeting one another with a holy kiss. It's interesting. The sign of peace used to be called the kiss of peace. And we make it the sign of peace. People are hugging, shaking hands, greeting one another. Now we're just asking people to wave. And there's some churches who have actually stopped the sign of peace because they don't want anybody to be tempted to give someone a big hug and a big kiss. So this is one, again, one of the situa situations of the pandemic that we're facing. And verse 21, Timothy, my co-worker greets you. So do Lucius and Jason and Sosipatar, my relatives. Now this is interesting, verse 22. I, Tertius, the writer of this letter, greet you in the Lord. Wait a second. Didn't we start off by saying that this is St. Paul's letter to the Romans? Haven't we all agreed that St. Paul wrote this letter Biblical scholars will all tell you that St. Paul wrote the letter to the Romans. But the question is, did he literally write it out by hand or did he have a scribe or basically a secretary to which he dictated the letter? That's who we believe Tertius is. And I think Tertius must have been a very interesting character. Did you notice how he slips this in here? I, Tertius, the writer of this letter, greet you in the Lord. You know, don't forget me. I'm the one that's doing all this. And I'm not doing this at a computer. I'm not doing this at a word processor. I'm writing this out by hand. So Church just kind of slips this in there a little bit. I imagine St. Paul just kind of looked at him and rolled his eyes and said, okay, fine, leave it in there. Who knows? Verse 23, Gaius, who is host to me and to the whole church, greets you. Erastus, the city treasurer, and our brother Cartus greets you. I urge you, brothers, to watch out for those who create dissensions and obstacles and opposition to the teaching that you have learned. Avoid them. Notice what St. Paul is doing here. He's had greetings to everybody, even Tertius. Greet everybody in the Lord. Welcome everybody. And then in verse 17, he kind of changes here a little bit. I urge you, brothers, to watch out for those who create dissensions and obstacles 
in opposition to the teaching that you have learned. Avoid them. A lot of people are tempted to get into the arguments with those who don't believe exactly what we do. I'm going to convince them through my persuasive words. St. Paul is saying, avoid them. Don't deal with them. Don't get into all this. You're not going to win. It's not going to be productive use of your time. In verse 18, for such people do not serve our Lord, but their own appetites. And by fair and flattering speech, they deceive the hearts of the innocent. Well, while your obedience is known to all, so that I rejoice over you, I want you to be wise as to what is good and simple as to what is evil. Very interesting thought there, being wise to what is good and simple as to what is evil. How do we become wise as to what is good? Journey through the Bible, our sacred scriptures, the inspired word of God, reading commentaries, studying with one another, praying with one another. That's what we look at the idea of to be wise as to what is good and simple as to what is evil. Walk away from the darkness, gather in the light. In verse 20, then the God of peace will quickly crush Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus be with you. This is the only time in St. Paul's letter to the Romans that he mentions Satan. And it's a passing where he says, then the God of peace will quickly crush Satan under your feet. The idea of conquering Satan, which is spelling the darkness and bringing the light. Now in verse 25, now to him who can strengthen you according to my gospel and the proclamation of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery kept secret for long ages, but now manifested to the prophetic writings and according to the commands of the eternal God made known to all nations to bring about the obedience of faith to the only wise God through Jesus Christ be glory forever and ever. Amen. St. Paul is concluding his letter to the Romans with one of the longest run-on sentences that we have. His expertise was not in grammar. It was in faith, hope, and love. Well, let's go back to verse 25. Now to him who can strengthen you, according to my gospel and the proclamation of Jesus Christ. When he says my gospel, it means the gospel he is proclaiming, obviously the gospel of Jesus according to the revelation of the mystery kept secret for long ages. Throughout the Old Testament, there was the secret of the mystery, the mystery of the Messiah. Who would he be? A business leader, a government leader, a military leader. What is he going to do? And when is he going to come? Verse 26, but now manifested through the prophetic writings and according to the command of the eternal God made known to all nations. According to the command of the eternal God and made known to all nations. What did Jesus tell us at the end of Matthew's gospel? Go and make disciples of all nations. And he continues in verse 26 to bring about the obedience of faith to the only wise God. Through Jesus Christ be glory forever and ever. Amen. And it's wonderful the way that he ends this. The only wise God through Jesus Christ be glory forever and ever. Amen. Well, I have thoroughly enjoyed this time with uh, St. Paul's letter to the Romans. I will tell you it is a challenging letter, and I find St. Paul's letters to be quite challenging, and I'm sure many of you do as well. I know a number of the lectors when they're coming to Mass and they're saying, wow, I'm supposed to do the first reading today, the prophet Isaiah. I'm so glad I don't have the second reading of St. Paul with his long run on sentences. But what we do know is that everything in the Bible is the inspired word of God, written by human beings under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So next week, we're going to continue in St. Paul's writings with his first letter to the Corinthians. Corinth is a city in modern-day Greece. It was probably one of the earlier writings of St. Paul. He actually wrote it from Ephesus, which is in modern-day Turkey. Paul founded the Christian community in Corinth, a seaport town in Macedonia, in modern-day Greece, during his second missionary journey. This would be around the year AD 51. The people of the Corinthian community that Paul had founded were predominantly Gentiles, that is, non-Jews, who had become Christians. 
We'll get into this more next week. We're just about running out of time here. So again, I wanna thank all of you for joining us as we continue our journey through the Bible. We give you thanks for all the blessings that God has bestowed upon us. We give thanks for all the scripture writers. So let's take a moment and bow our heads in prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Good and gracious God, once again, we come before you as your children, recognizing these blessings and graces of the sacred scripture. And yes, while we're muddling through some of St. Paul's long run-on sentences, we know the message of, the, of his writings is the message of the gospel, to love God and love one another. That is the fulfillment of the law, and that is our calling, that is our blessing. And loving God, I call upon your blessings on all of us here today, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, this is a new computer, and I'm going to go over here, and I'm going to press on end. One, two, three. Okay, end message, leave meeting. Okay, hopefully that's, I don't know if this is still recording or not. I'm going to unplug it and take it over to Stephanie and make sure that this is over. If not, you will get a wonderful tour of our parish office as I'm leaving the lounge, heading in to the St. Margaret Mary room into a dark, desolate hallway, but there is light. See the light? Okay. All righty, I, I think I'm done and I think it's turned off, but would you make sure because otherwise it's gonna be. Oh, it's still recording. It's still recording, okay.